That'll wake you up. Sure. Right, well we just about it got everything connected up here. Okay. Right, well let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today, Lord, for another opportunity to open the Scriptures, to read and understand more of Thy Holy Word, which has been preserved for us in our own mother tongue. We thank Thee, Lord, for it. And we pray that we would study it, rightly divide it, and extract from it what we need, Lord, in this age to further Thy work. And we pray, Lord, for each soul here. We don't understand all the difficulties that each person here is going through, but, Lord, you do. We, we trust in thee, and we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, uh, we're... We need the microphone. I've turned this one on. Yeah, it's on. We'll scream it out. It's too low. Don't worry, I'm going to speak it out anyway. I'm usually too loud. Um, in fact, usually I distort all the sound because I'm too loud. So let's hope that doesn't work like that this time. Now we're in the book of Galatians, and uh, there's a whole lot of things that are coming at me as I read. You know, a lot of people uh, that I've talked to who are in the ministry, and from time to time I go to meetings where ministers gather, and many of the ministers, they, they complain that they, they don't know what to preach meaning that they're, they're not sure of, about, well, where can I find a new message? And I have to confess, and this is not a boast, but it has never been that way for me. My problem is, of all the things that I could preach, what one should I choose? I find the Bible is just filled with teaching and things that are relevant and exciting, and I always learn. I might read the book of Galatians 10 times, I read it another time, the 11th time, and there's something new, there's something new in the same verse that I've read maybe 10 times, and I come back to the same verse, and there it is, something new, and so it is here. And so I think the Bible is going to keep us busy right through our lives, and I'm, I'm very thankful for, to God that he's superintended to preserve this book for us. Now we're up to chapter 3. Uh, and it's always tempting for me to do a whole big summary. But as we get further into the book of Galatians, if all we do is summarize, we don't quite move on. So I've got to be a bit careful of the summary uh, material we, we go through. Um, we have been looking at this uh, subject of the faith of Christ, and it's very, very important. And it uh, is one which reminds me of my own life and my own weaknesses, and in the, in the face of this terrible incident in Moor with the tornadoes and the destruction there, you can imagine that many Christians there would perhaps point their finger at God and, and maybe wonder at God why he allowed this to happen to their families, their children perhaps have been killed, uh, others died, their homes taken. And perhaps we could say that in, in our own lives, if we were to investigate our own lives, perhaps we could uh, admit that we had our peaks in our faith, you know, if we looked at the, our own personal faith and we, we looked at how it, it would run. And then uh, something would happen that perhaps our faith would drop. And we may not admit it. You know, we may keep it to ourselves. But in the depths of our heart, we would perhaps admit at times there have been low points in our faith. And so it goes. Perhaps that would be true of you. I can testify and admit it has been for me at times. There have been times of tremendous sadness. Uh, I lost my, my sister 
Uh, she, she developed breast cancer. She had an operation. She recovered from the operation, it appeared. But it got into the bloodstream and sooner or later it appeared in various other parts of her body. And uh, even her doctor did not actually diagnose her as having cancer. She actually diagnosed her as having uh, some kind of lung infection and a severe case of asthma. And what we did was we just, we believed the doctor, which I would warn you against. I would warn you that you should always take second, third, fourth, fifth opinions on many things, you know. However, we, we heard what we wanted to hear, perhaps. Let's, let's say that. And so it was in the middle of the winter and, and so we said, okay, Suzanne, I think what we should do is get you out of this terrible cold and damp climate we have in New Zealand. Go off to Samoa in the Pacific Islands and get some nice warmth there. And so she did. Off she went with her husband. And there she died. She, we got the, a sad call um, that she had passed away. Very low point in my life. Very low. And so it is. I think perhaps you, you, you do get that. And there are high points. And if we were to rest on our own personal faith for, number one, our justification, and number two, how we live, then how we live and our confidence of our salvation would also follow this curve. And that would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? It would be a terrible thing. But when we look at our justification, and we see that, in fact, we can rely on the faith of Christ. And we have done a study of this at Derek's place where we, we looked at this whole matter of, well, what kind of testimony did Christ have in terms of going to the cross? We find that, yes, he had tremendous faith. He prayed to God and God heard him in that he feared God. The book of Hebrews says because he had great piety, his faith was rock solid. And he went all the way to the cross, died our death. We have life through his faith. So that's a tremendous thing to look to in times of trouble in our own personal faith, perhaps wavering. But the faith of Christ is a tremendous teaching. It's all through Galatians and it's all through Romans. It's a great, great teaching. And uh, we've talked about that. Um, we also talked about this tremendous passage in Galatians 2.18. And what this relates to, we just have a quick look at it. For if I build again the things uh, which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I make myself a transgressor. And there is the word here, transgressor. And that comes from a verb. Um, which is parabino, which in turn comes from this word basis, basis. And we get our English word basis. It actually means a foot. And if you look at the root idea of a transgressor, it's someone who's either got the wrong basis or has no basis. And this is a tremendous teaching because when you think about what's happening in this age, when you look what's going on in this age, we have our Acts 28 boundary here and here we live. This is where we live, right? That's our age. We live here. Right here. All right, well, then... Prior to the beginning of this age, there would have been a certain basis. That is, the way that you would live your life if you were living in that age is you would ascertain this basis. And that would be the foundation by which you lived then. It would involve all sorts of things. It would, be, it would involve understanding your hope, which was Israel's hope. You were grafted in with an unnatural graft into the olive of Israel. Yeah, you partook of Israel's hope. Yes, a lot of things would relate to that basis. And you would explain the age that you lived on on the basis of that basis, that foundation. You explain everything. Okay, but if things change, if things move, then you must ask yourself, well, if the age has changed, what is our basis? 
How do we now build our foundation on top? So here is it perhaps our basis. And we build our superstructure on top. If you have the wrong basis, what's going to happen to your building? Well, it's just going to crack and develop fissures and uh, with a little tremor of an earthquake coming through, the thing will ultimately collapse. And your personal faith will bottom out big time. And while people do have the wrong basis today by, in order to live and have their being and explain things, and they many times do have the wrong basis, what do they do? Instead of saying, well, this is not working. No, what they do is they reinterpret reality. They reinterpret reality and they make things fit. They can't speak in tongues. They cannot resurrect anybody from the dead. They cannot do these things which are going on during the book of Acts, which this basis explains. It doesn't work. So what do they do? They emote themselves. They change the scriptures to make things fit. And that's what's going on. And when I discovered this, I felt, the world needs to know this. The world of Christianity must know this. How? How are we going to do it? And that reminds me of my picture over here. You see, isn't it strange that Hollywood at times comes up with stuff which is actually more true than what the Christian world seems to be preaching. That's a bit of a disgrace, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, it is, a, it is a bit strange that. At times it happens. And Morpheus here is really a good picture of what's going on in the Christian world. The Christian world is asleep. It's living in a dream world with the wrong basis. They have taken the blue pill. They've taken it and they've swallowed it. And they're living in this dream world where they are manufacturing in their mind, helped by the, the computer, the matrix. They're propping up this view. Now, the red pill, it hurts, man. When you take the red pill, it hurts. Because reality can be stark at times. It can really punch. But man, once you see reality, once you have been taken out of that little cubicle with all these tubes stuck in you, and you're just being controlled by some machine, and you've been made free from it, then you are free indeed, man. And you're excited. And what do you want to do? You want to make the rest of humanity free, don't you? You want to make the rest of humanity free. And you've got to preach the gospel. The gospel. Why is it red? The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. Why is it blue? Well, you know, you can look in the clouds and you can look in the, the blue sky, but that's all nice and blue and fluffy and furry, but it's not reality. Come back to reality. Paul brings up the gospel of the uncircumcision. And in doing so, he shows the basis of any true gospel. And that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and all these wonderful truths concerning faith. Yeah, that's right. Now, let's get back to the Bible. I don't want to get on to Morpheus. You could actually preach many sermons out of the Matrix. You could, actually. There's so many connections in there, uh, we could do it. Now, I'm not suggesting we should all get the, 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 the film series, The Matrix. There's a whole lot of garbage in there, but the, I'm talking about the idea. I'm talking about the idea behind it, the philosophy that's going on there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there that are, that's biblical and true, actually. Now, so let's have a look at Galatians 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish uh, Galatians. Foolish. What a wonderful way of start. Oh, foolish Northside people. No. Foolish in this case means people who are not thinking. They're unwise because they're not considering. And behind this word foolish is the word noose. 
nous, which has to do with the mind, not applying the mind. Now, listen to me. One of the big things that's going to come out of this particular sermon today from the book of Galatians is the, uh, this idea. 1 Corinthians 9.16. In there, it talks about Paul, where he preaches, and he says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me. And many people take that to mean, oh, that's all we do. That's all we should do is just preach the gospel and nothing else. I used to go to a church where that is exactly their philosophy. If you came along to one of their sermons and services, what would happen? Gospel. Nothing else. Gospel. Sinners, repent. Receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And that was the extent of the message. They would bring forth lovely musical instruments and man, all sorts of talent would be brought forward. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that. What I'm saying, what I'm suggesting to you is that they are fooled if they think that all we need to do is preach the gospel and nothing else. Paul here is reminding these Galatians that they're without mind in what they're doing. And the only way they're going to get straightened out is if they get their mind right. Mind is important. Thinking is important. Logic is important. The reason why I'm so excited about right division is because it appeals to my logic. And I like that. I want to be a Christian that has a brain. It's not to be lobotomized. It's to be enacted, refreshed, and energized. And I want to see the scriptures hang together logically. And I find that is the case. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who hath bewitched you? Someone has. Someone is in the process of doing it. Bewitched. Bewitched. Well, that's the evil eye. The evil eye. Remember the time in which these people were li living is the Acts period. During this time, Israel was still first. All sorts of signs and wonders were going on. There were people demon-possessed. There were all sorts of things going on. And he says, Who hath given you this evil eye that you should not obey the truth? Now here's a thought. Truth comes, but is it just to be put on a memory card and stashed away? No, there is some sort of obedience that's related to it. Paul talks about this in Romans. The obedience of faith. Faith, yes, we understand that. But with this comes some kind of obedience that's related to it. And what we have today is people who've got the wrong basis and then proclaiming on that basis some sort of obedience, which is not correct because their basis is wrong. How do we show that to them? How do we bring them to this knowledge? I don't have the answer completely. But all I know is it's going to take a lot of patience. And patience sometimes that I have to admit I've failed on. <laughs> okay, so it goes on. It says, not obey the truth before whose eyes. Isn't it interesting here that it says eyes? Before whose eyes? Someone gave the evil eye, but your eyes have seen this. It says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently said, placarded. You've seen these people wandering around with these great big placards with writing on it. And it's clear to read. You understand what it says because it's very short. I hate you. <laughs> you know, you understand exactly what it says because it's made nice and short, big letters, big writing. It's made real brief and clear. Yes, it's been made clear. Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Then he does this in verse 2. Look at it. This only. Now, here is something that you should ask yourself. Who is learning here? This only would I learn, Paul says, I learn of you. This only would I learn of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Why mention this? Why emphasize this? Because here... He's going into the mind. Here he is reasoning. This only would I learn. This is Socratic. If you ever read anything of Socrates, by the way, if there ever was a Socrates, 
avoid them because he'd drive you crazy. If you were to, to talk with Socrates, he'd drive you crazy, man, with the questions he'd give you. And any person that was to sit down with the Socrates would be driven to the, just to the end of their patience. Very good with questioning. But one of the big problems with Socrates is he didn't really bring the answers. Very good questions. But the answers, well, it's pretty debatable how many answers he actually had. But what Paul is doing here is he's taking a Socratic method here by asking questions. This only would I learn. See, that's what Socrates would do. Well, tell me. Teach me. You know. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Works of the law. How did you receive this? Did you work for it or did it come as a gift? All the examples you find in the book of Acts is the Spirit just fell on them. Just came on them. This only would I learn. Verse 3. Are you so foolish? Again, are you in this way foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You've begun in the Spirit. Now, are you going to try and perfect yourself by these works? And the answer, of course, is no. You're not going to perfect yourself in that way at all. Have you suffered so many things in vain? You've suffered for the truth. Now, are you, if you take this road of trying to perfect yourself with works, it's going to be empty in the end. But then he, he gives a little light at the end of the tunnel. He says, if it be yet in vain. In other words, he's not saying to the Galatians, it's all over, you're really messed up, that's it. No, no. You've, you've earned a lot of respect in what you've done and the things you've suffered, and I don't want it to be in vain. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you. Okay, now I'm going to just sort of play the devil's advocate. Boy, that's a bad phrase, isn't it? But you understand what I mean. Um, let's just preach this as someone that does not know anything about right division. What we need in this church is we need miracles to be performed. We need the administering of the Holy Spirit. We need to see miracles happening in here. And if you people had the faith, you would see these miracles happening in among you. But you see, that would be incorrect to do that. It would be incorrect to do that. Why? Because you're taking the wrong basis. This book belongs to the book of Acts when Israel was first and where Israel was being given the advantage as a nation. Now we're going to find later on that if they believed their scriptures, they would understand that salvation, in salvation, there's no difference. There's no advantage. Yes, that's true. But as far as a nation, they had the advantage. And so because of that, the Spirit was given with all sorts of miracles to bring repentance to Israel. That's the context. And to take that out of this context and preach something else is going to destroy someone's faith. He says, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, the hearing of faith comes through. Obviously, that's the case. And then he moves into Abraham. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. First question is why does Paul take them to Abraham? Because all the Jews believed that they were children, descendants of Abraham. They took great pride in this. But what is so wonderful about Abraham is, as we read in Romans, that there was a time when Abram was uncircumcised. And in that time when he was uncircumcised, he believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so what you have is right in their own scriptures is the basis for justification by faith. It's right there in their own scriptures. So it makes good logical sense why Paul would address this. Remember, he's dealing with Peter and all his problems. And he says um, here, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. Um, there's a picture here. Yeah, I'll just go back up here. Page up. 
Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted. It was counted. What does that mean? Well, God simply reckoned it for right. There was no work of righteousness in there. He simply believed and then God saw that belief and he accounted it for righteousness. Well, what on earth does that mean? Here we have $5 note. We still have pennies because inflation hasn't got to the point where pennies are no longer of any value. We still have pennies. Hopefully the American dollar will start going up and become once again a very powerful currency. It always used to be when I was a kid growing up in New Zealand we, how much was it? It was about two New Zealand dollars for one American dollar. Now I think it's pretty on par. But anyway, here we've got five dollar note. And it says Federal, Federal Reserve Note. And there's a little signature down the bottom here. What is this thing? It's just a hunk of paper with some ink on it. Its intrinsic value is zip. Really, just a piece of paper with some writing on it. Yet, because of the Federal Reserve Authority, the authority of the United States of America, this note is going to be counted for some value, other than its intrinsic value, which is virtually zip, which is virtually zero. It would be counted for five. And if it was 50, it would be counted for 50. And if it was 100, it would be counted for 100. Why? Because the authority that's stamped on there, it will be counted for whatever amount. Okay. Abram, he believed God. He believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. That little belief was counted for $5? No. $50? No. $100, no. Something that you could not put a value on. It is so valuable, you couldn't even put a dollar value on it. It's inestimable in its value. But because of the authority that counts it so, it's true. It's true because of the authority that's on that. And that's God. God counted it to him for righteousness. He was counted righteous not because he really in and of himself was. In fact, if you look at his history, it's not too hot. But it's counted for righteousness. And we find this said over and over again also in the book of Romans. A great truth. So in verse 7 it says this, uh, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. The same are the children of Abraham. Remember, this is during the book of Acts. And what we're finding now is that Paul is going to use Abraham as a means of showing how Gentiles could, number one, be saved by faith, and secondly, how that they could gain inheritance. How it is that they could have a hope through this promise that was given to Abraham. We'll read this later on. But it's interesting, the logic as to why he would choose Abraham. And it says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now see where it says, children of Abraham. Children. Children of Abraham, it, it actually means sons. And you know, uh, you're born as a child in the society, in the world in which this was written, a person would be born, yes, and uh, they would grow, the, 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 they would get to a particular age, and then they became declared as sons. That is, they became to the point of maturity where they could be declared sons. And so it is here, by faith, the same are the children of Abraham. They're declared sons. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify, foreseeing, look at this, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the heathen through faith, 
preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, so what's the content of this? In thee shall all nations be blessed. In thee. How? How in thee? So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Here comes the whole logic of justification by faith. Inheritance. How it is that the Gentiles in that age could find inheritance with Israel? Because they would have the same father, Father Abraham. And Paul can justify it from their own scriptures. And it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, verse 10, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Oh boy. Now you want to put yourself under a curse? Then what you, you can do is dispel all things about right division. Just say, oh no, there's no such thing as Paul's gospel. There's no such thing as Acts 28, 28 being some sort of division. Oh no, it's all just the same. Okay, go right ahead. What you're going to do is you're going to put yourself under a curse. You'll put yourself under a curse. You'll put yourself into a situation where you are going to try and earn your salvation. Look at this with me. We're in Galatians. It's not too far away. Let's see how Paul puts this in order. Ephesians 2, verse 8. A great passage. But I want us to read 8, 9, and 10 to get things into, its, into their logical order. There's a beautiful order here. This is Paul speaking to the Ephesians. And in this age, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, I want to just tell you of, of a little difficulty. You've heard of people called um, five-point Calvinists. And five-point Calvinists, they basically teach that when you're saved, you're saved not by your faith. It's a faith that just is given to you, and you have absolutely nothing to do with it at all. Nothing. Zero. Zero. Nothing. You are simply elected before the foundation of the world. God saw ahead of time that there's going to be his creation. And he, according to his own will, said this group here is going to be saved. And that group there is not going to be saved. And that's it. And you have nothing to do with it. Nothing. It's just simply God's choice. Right? And some, not all, but some will take this passage here to teach it in a way. Look at it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, what's the that? Well, a lot of those people who are five-point Calvinists, as I said, not all of them, not all of them, but some of them, say, well, that refers to the faith. Which it does seem to, doesn't it? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, that faith, not of yourselves. See? Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The faith is the gift of God. See? So you're saved by grace. You, you all considered this before? Have you considered this before, what I'm talking about? That the faith here is not your own? It's, just, it's quite, quite well taught by, and by many churches. So it does seem to be true too. I mean, you would say that, well, it's closest antecedent would be faith right you always that's generally in English what you do you take the closest antecedent and the closest closest antecedent to that is faith so you'd say for by grace are you saved through faith and that faith not of yourselves that faith it is the gift of God right you like that so therefore that supports the five points at least in part and it goes on, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. Okay, verse 9, not of works. So, uh, what, what do I say about that? Well, there are some times in the Bible that Greek really helps. 
It really does. This is one of them. And there is one rule of Greek grammar, and that is that the antecedent should degree with its noun in its gender. And it doesn't. If you take the that with the faith, it, the, the genders don't match. So it can't be. That cannot be the correct interpretation. So when it says that, whatever you believe the that is, it can't refer simply to the faith. And most people now have come to realize, well, it must be that whole by grace are you saved through faith. That's it. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's it. That's it. That's the that. Okay, so for, for by grace are you saved through faith. That, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Ah, yes, so that whole system of salvation by grace through faith, that's the gift of God. You, you see what I'm saying here? And then it goes on and says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then it goes on, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay, what am I saying? I'm saying that Paul is completely consistent in his teaching through Galatians, through Romans, and in Ephesians on what justification is about. Faith of Christ, yes, all of that all fits together. And that what we have here is we have, first of all, number one, justification, justification by faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. Justification comes there. Then after that comes works. The works are built upon the right foundation. So the salvation comes first. And then comes the works after that. And it makes perfect sense. We understand why it should be that way. What are people doing today in, in religious circles? They are inverting this. Why are they inverting it? Because they're not listening to Paul. They are not understanding the gospel of the uncircumcision. They're not understanding the basis of any true gospel. And secondly, they're not understanding this clear teaching that justification comes first and then we should build upon it. Okay, so uh, we just went a little, little bit out of Galatians. I don't like doing that too much, but we, we need to there, I think. Let's have a look at Galatians 3 and in verse um, 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. Okay, so you want to go back to the law, then you better do it all. Do it all. And once you, once you try and do it all, you'll be brought to realization you can't. And it says in verse 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. What is interesting about this is, let me just go back here. The Jews have a whole system of commentators, and some of them are very famous. This guy lived in the Middle Ages, Moses Maimonides, very famous guy, Jewish guy, and he was born 1135, he died in 1204, he was born in Spain and he died in Cairo. But he wrote a whole lot, and one of the things he did was um, he came up with 613 precepts. And in the Talmud and other writings, you'll find that the Jews will gather together these things. Precepts by which you should live in order to gain righteousness. And then the same uh, writings of the Jews would say, yeah, but David brings it down to 11 in Psalm 15. And then uh, down to 6 in Isaiah. And then further to 3 in Micah. And then further by Isaiah to 2. And then in Amos to 1. And finally in Habakkuk to this great passage. The just shall live by faith. What is interesting is that Paul brings up this truth. Which is embedded in the very fabric of the teaching of the Jews. And he brings up this truth. That yes, the just shall live by faith. You want to have life? 
then you've got to come to God by faith and he will account that for righteousness. And as we go through this, we're going to learn more about what it means for the, Jew, the Gentiles during this time to have faith as Abraham did and what their hope would be. What is the hope? Because it's rest upon promises that were given to Abraham. And we can learn more about it. Well, I think I'm out of time. And uh, we'll continue this next time. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for the Bible, for all that it contains, all the truth that's in there. And Lord, we thank Thee for the book of Galatians in particular, that we can read it, understand it, and see its place and purposes, and what God is doing during the book of Acts, what He's doing today. We thank Thee, our Father, for the truths that we've learnt. And Lord, we know we don't understand it all. We ask for Your Spirit to work in our lives, bring us to understanding more and more. In Christ's name, Amen. Right, let's stand to sing.